Welcome back. In this web lecture and in the next, we're going to be looking at how plants respond to both internal and external signals. So we're going to be building up to how plants are going to respond to factors in their environment. So this first web lecture is going to focus on the signaling molecules that are going to convey the information and elicit a response. And then in the next web lecture, we'll look at the different kinds of things that plants can respond to and how these hormones help to mediate those responses. So to start out, I just want to go all the way back to the very first class at the very beginning of the semester to this list of what all living things do. And we're going to focus on this ability of living things to respond to their environment. And in order to do that, organisms need to be able to transmit information about what's going on both in their bodies and external to their bodies out in the environment uh, throughout the body to be able to produce a coordinated and appropriate response to that stimulus. So we're going to first look at these signaling, these information signaling molecules, the plant hormones, and then next time we're going to see how those hormones allow plants to respond to their environment. So plants receive and must respond appropriately to a wide variety of environmental stimuli. Plants can sense and respond to information about light, gravity, pressure, and wounds. We'll be taking a look at all of these as we go. Plants actually do have a sort of sensory system that allows them to detect chemicals in their environment. So they have the ability to detect and respond to airborne molecules, so something equivalent to a sense of smell. And they also have an ability to detect and respond to dissolved chemicals, so this would be analogous to a sense of taste. So let's see how this information processing works in plants. So plants gather, process, and respond to the information that they can monitor in a three-step process. So first of all, sensory cells receive an external signal and change it into an intracellular signal. So we saw this when we looked at cell signaling, how something that happens outside the cell can cause a change in shape in molecules inside the cell to turn that into an intracellular signal that can then go on to produce a response. So the sensory cells then send a signal to target cells in other parts of the plant body. So here we have cell-cell signaling of that signal to coordinate a whole body response to that stimulus. And then finally, target cells receive the signal and change their activity in some way to produce an appropriate response. So this is going to connect with what we've already learned earlier in the semester about signal transduction pathways, um, linking signal reception to some kind of cellular response. So as the example we're going to work through of this, we're going to think about a potato left growing in darkness, and it's going to produce pale stems unexpanded leaves and short roots. So we call this condition etiolated. So these are morphological adaptations for growing in darkness. There's no point in producing chlorophyll if you're not exposed to light. There's no point in expending energy to expand the leaves. Basically what you want to do if you're in darkness, chances are you're underground. You want to grow up toward the light as quickly as possible and not invest resources in um, what you're not going to need until you actually get to the light. After exposure to light, a potato undergoes a change called de in which shoots and roots grow normally. So your potato, once you turn the lights on in this experimental version, is going to produce normal leaves, normal roots. And this de response is an example of cell signal processing. So we'll take a closer look at how this cell signal processing works in this case. So as we saw, in our earlier unit on cell signaling, the stages are reception, transduction, and response. So first, looking at reception, uh, you'll recall that there's some kind of signal. When we were thinking about cell signaling before, it was usually um, a molecule that was the signal. In this case, with the de response, it's going to be light. Light is going to be the signal that's detected by a receptor inside or outside the cell. And these are going to be proteins that change in shape in response to the specific stimulus. So light, in this case, of de the receptor is a phytochrome. The signal is light. 
and this phytochrome is, is able to detect the incoming light. So then as we move to transduction, now we have second messengers that are going to transfer and amplify signals from the receptors to proteins that are going to cause the responses. So in our particular case of the deadulation response, this activated receptor is going to activate two types of second messengers, calcium ions, which in this case are going to be imported from outside the cell, and also cyclic GMP, so a similar molecule to cyclic AMP, only using guanosine instead of adenosine, so cyclic GMP. So the phytochrome receptor is going to respond to light by opening calcium channels, which increase the calcium level in the cytosol. So we're going to release the calcium to use as a second messenger. And it's going to activate an enzyme that produces cyclic GMP. So this is the other second messenger that's produced. And then the response is going to be a signal transduction pathway that's going to lead to regulation of one or more cellular activities. That's the response to this signal. In most cases, these responses to stimulation involve increased activity of enzymes. So this can occur either by transcriptional regulation, so by producing new proteins, or post-translational modification, modifying proteins that have already been, been translated, changing them from an inactive to an active form. So let's look at each of these in turn. Post-translational modification can involve the modification of existing proteins in the signal response. Remember, this is going to be the best way to do things if you need a rapid response. You can have proteins that are already present in the cytoplasm in inactive form, and then it's very easy to just activate those proteins. You don't have to go through the whole process of transcription and translation to get those proteins moving. Modification often involves the phosphorylation of specific amino acids. The second messengers in this system, cyclic GMP and calcium ions, activate protein kinases directly. So they're going to interact directly with these protein kinases. Then these protein kinases often work in a cascade. So remember these cascades of protein kinases, one kinase phosphorylating the next one, linking the initial stimulus to some form of gene expression through phosphorylation of transcription factors. Protein phosphatases, remember, are going to switch off the signal transduction pathways by dephosphorylating those active proteins, uh, changing them back into their inactive form. So now if we think about the cellular response in terms of transcriptional regulation, specific transcription factors are going to bind directly to specific regions of DNA and control transcription of specific genes. And so some transcription factors can work as activators that increase the transcription of specific genes. So these regions of DNA can either be right adjacent to the promoter or actually even at some distance from it, and the DNA will actually change shape to bring these enhancer regions in close proximity with this transcription initiation complex to increase the rate of transcription. Other transcription factors can be repressors that are going to decrease the transcription of specific genes, and those are not shown here, but they can also be close to or far, far from this promoter region and work in a similar way, only to repress transcription. And the response is de response protein. So what does that entail? So de activates enzymes that do several things. Um, first of all, enzymes that function in photosynthesis directly, so we're going to start to get the machinery involved in photosynthesis up and running. They're going to supply the chemical precursors for chlorophyll production, and it's also going to affect the levels of plant hormones that are going to regulate growth and cause all of these parts to grow in the right way at the right rate in a way that maximizes the productivity of the plant. So let's look more closely at these substances, these signaling substances that are going to be produced as a result of this response to light and in response to lots of other kinds of stimuli in the environment. So plant hormones are chemical signals that modify or control one or more specific physiological processes within a plant. So plant hormones are also called plant growth regulators to distinguish them from hormones that you find in animals that are 
generally thought of as being distributed just through a circulatory system. These are going to be distinguished by being able to move through the plant in various ways, either system-wide or just locally, um, but they are communication signaling molecules that are going to regulate plant growth. So remember that plants generally respond to their environment by growing in particular ways. This is a plant's form of behavior. Its response is going to be some form of growth usually. So general characteristics of plant hormones, they're produced in very low concentrations but can have profound effects on growth and development. Remember this whole transduction process that can amplify that signal and produce a large effect even for a very small amount of signal. Each hormone has multiple effects. It's going to have different effects on different tissues depending on where it finds itself and conversely any particular physiological process can be influenced by multiple hormones and a balance of those hormones is going to determine the, the details of that response. Plant responses depend on the amount and concentration of specific hormones and often on the combination of hormones present and what are the relative amounts of those hormones. The major plant hormones include what we call sort of the big five over here on the left, auxin, cytokinins, gibberellins, abscisic acid, and ethylene, as well as a couple of groups of more recently discovered plant hormones, the brassinosteroids, the jasminates, and the strigolactones. So first let's think about how hormones travel through a plant body. So hormones may be transmitted from cell to cell in several ways. First, it could be by specialized transport proteins in cell membranes. It's going to transmit these hormones from cell to cell. They can be transmitted in xylem or phloem sap for a system-wide response if it needs to be transmitted throughout the plant. That's your best bet. And finally, it can be by simple diffusion alone, starting at a source and diffusing out. That gives you a nice concentration gradient that will give you a larger response the closer you are to that source. Plant cells may receive several hormones at once, so there's going to be an interaction between different hormones, and it's common for different hormones to interact with one another, and that's going to modulate the cell's response. That interaction between hormones, the balance of different hormone levels, is going to determine what kind of response the plant will have. So to start thinking about these hormones, we're going to think about a particular response to an environmental stimulus, and this is known as the phototropic response. So plants sense and respond to a specific narrow range of wavelengths of light in the visible spectrum. And experiments by Charles Darwin and his son Francis with coleoptiles, so these are modified leaves that form a sheath that protects emerging grass shoots. So these are at the very tips of growing shoots in grass. So they germinated seeds in the dark and placed the young straight coleoptiles next to a light source and they found that the coleoptiles grew toward the light due to the elongation of cells on the shaded side of the plant. So there's this attraction, this tendency of the plants to grow toward the light and this is what we call phototropism, directed movement in response to light. So the Darwins found that plants bend only toward light that includes blue wavelengths. So these wavelengths along with red wavelengths, remember, are important for photosynthesis. They're going to be absorbed readily by chlorophyll. So here's a diagram of some of their experiments. So the first one that was just described basically just documented this bending toward the light by elongation of the shaded side. They did additional experiments that established, first of all, it was actually the tip that was initiating this response, so if they cut off the very tip of the coleoptile, there was no response. They established that it was light that it was responding to, that, that light had to actually touch that tip of the coleoptile to produce the response. If they put an opaque cap over the tip, no response because the light was not reaching that tip. But if they put a transparent cap over the tip, the phototropic response occurred. And it's only determined at the tip if they covered other parts of the growing shoot with an opaque cover, they still got this response. So it's basically being mediated just by cells within that tip.
Subsequent experiments later on showed that it was actually a mobile chemical that was being transmitted down through the plant that allowed this response to occur. So if we have, if we place a material in between the tip and the rest of the chute so that chemicals could be transmitted right through this permeable gelatin, we still got the response. But if we use a different material, mica, um, to separate the tip from the rest of the chute that's impermeable to the passage of chemicals, we don't get the response. So it's something about chemicals that are being transmitted from this tip down the plant that is causing this response. So, so far we know that we've got a response to light, it's happening at the tip, and it's happening due to some kind of chemicals that are moving from the tip down through the plant. Subsequent experiments by a scientist named Fritz Wendt extended these results and what he did was he used agar blocks to collect up whatever the chemical was that was spreading through the plant from oat coleoptal tips. So he was collecting up the phototropic hormone, the one that's causing this response, and he placed them off-center on decapitated oat coleoptals. He cut the tip off, he placed the tip on an agar block to collect up the hormones that were diffusing away from it, now that the hormones are in the agar block, he'd put it on one side or the other of this decapitated plant and found that wherever he placed the block, that's where the elongation was happening and the plant would bend in the opposite direction toward the side that did not have the block with the hormone. This hormone is going to cause bending by elongating the cells on the side that's exposed to this hormone. So although whence coleoptyls were grown in the dark, the experimental coleoptyls responded by bending. So this is not a response to light in this case, it's just a response to the hormone being applied. So Wendt later named this hormone, which was the very first plant hormone ever discovered, he called it auxin. Auxin was later identified as a substance called indole acetic acid. And another scientist as well as Wendt uh, independently proposed that phototropism results from an asymmetric distribution of auxin. So this hypothesis makes two predictions. One is that auxin is produced at the tips of coleoptyls and is transported more down the shaded side than the illuminated side of the stem, and that this asymmetric distribution of auxin causes cells on the shaded side to elongate more than cells on the illuminated side, and that would cause this bending toward the source of the light. So to test this hypothesis, another scientist, Winslow Briggs, inserted thin sheets of mica horizontally into coleoptal tips. So as predicted, the auxin concentrations were the same on the lighted and shaded sides of the divided tip. So there's no difference in the production of auxin there at the tip between the shaded side and the lit side. But if a path was available for the transmission of that auxin down the stem, if it had a way to move down the stem, what they found was that more auxin accumulated on the shaded side. So this means it's not an increase in production of auxin, it's an increase in the transport of the auxin down the stem that causes this response. So these results supported the chalodny went hypothesis that it's um, an asymmetry in the movement of auxin that's causing this bending response. It's differences in transport, and the transport of auxin is polar. Do not get confused with the use of the same term polar that we use to describe molecules that have partial charges on them. This has nothing to do with that. Polar just means that there's going to be a difference between one side and another. In this case, the polarity refers to the fact that it's produced in shoot tips and is transported down the stem, and this is because of differences in the distribution of transporter proteins that are going to move auxin from one cell into another, and these are going to move the hormone just from the basal end of one cell into the apical end of the neighboring cell in one direction only. So from the basal end to the apical end. So there's that difference between the basal side of the cell and the apical side of the cell, which is where we get this term 
since oxen is typically produced in the tips of shoots, you might think that this movement in one direction is just due to gravity, but researchers have found that even if they turn the shoot upside down and reverse the pull of gravity, the direction of oxen transport doesn't change. So it's due strictly to this difference of the transporter proteins always transporting oxen from the basal end of one cell into the apical end of the neighboring cell down through the stem. So what does auxin actually do when it reaches its target cells? So once auxin binds to receptors in the target stem cells, the signaling pathway that follows increases the number of membrane proton pumps, so these hydrogen ion pumps in the plasma membrane. This is what's going to trigger cell elongation leading to phototropism. So cell elongation just on the shaded side leading to that bending toward the light. And the acid growth hypothesis is the current best explanation for how this cell elongation response occurs. So the acid growth hypothesis for cell elongation uh, is thus named because the proton pumps drive protons out of the cell against an electrochemical gradient. And this is going to lower the pH just outside the cell membrane in the cell wall. So two things have to happen for a plant cell to get larger, to elongate. So first of all, the cell wall has to gain some flexibility. It has to be able to expand to increase the actual size of the cell. And then after that, you need to have water entering the cell to increase the cell volume. So we're going to generate turgor pressure that's going to expand the cell contents in and actually push the cell wall, um, allowing it to expand. So how does this happen? So first, we start with this increase in the number of proton pumps in the cell membrane in response to auxin. So there are going to be more of these proteins inserted into the cell membrane. And they're going to pump a lot of hydrogen ions out of the cell, across the cell membrane, and into the cell wall. So what do the hydrogen ions do once they get into the cell wall? They're going to activate proteins called expansins. So what expansins do are they interfere with these cross-linking proteins that firmly attach adjacent strands of cellulose to one another and allow them to move a little bit relative to each other. They kind of loosen up this network of cellulose that constrains the size of the cell wall. So simultaneously, as a direct result, of the electrochemical gradient that's generated by pumping all these ions, these hydrogen ions, out of the cell, that's going to also bring more ions into the cell along that electrochemical gradient, and in particular, uh, potassium ions and also chloride ions are going to be entering the cell as a result of that proton pumping. So as those ions start entering the cell, water is going to follow by osmosis, responding to that increased solute gradient, and that's going to cause the expansion of the cell contents that are going to create the turgor pressure that's going to push on that cell wall that's now been loosened up and made more flexible by the expansions and allow that entire cell to elongate. So auxin also plays a role in normal development of plants, um, not just in these particular responses to environmental factors. So the polar transport of auxin plays a role in the pattern formation of the developing plant. So how that plant is going to be organized going from roots to shoots. So reduced auxin flow from the shoot of a branch stimulates growth in lower branches. So we're going to see as we go along that auxin is very important in this phenomenon of apical dominance, the apical bud actually repressing growth of the axial buds lower down on the plant. Auxin transport also plays a role in phyllotaxy. So remember, this is the arrangement of leaves on the stem, whether you have one or more leaves coming from a particular node and how those leaves are oriented with respect to one another. Oxen is going to be an important factor in creating those patterns. And also polar transport of oxen from the leaf margins, so the outer edge of the leaves, is going to direct leaf venation patterns. So you only get the continuous organized pattern of vascular tissue, these leaf veins um, within the leaf, 
if you have the proper signaling from auxin. And also the activity of the vascular cambium, where the secondary growth is occurring in woody plants, is also under the control of auxin transport. So now let's look at one of the other major categories of plant hormones, the cytokinins. So cytokinins are mostly associated with cell division, so they're going to promote cell division. Cytokinins are synthesized in the root tips and also in young fruits and growing buds and other developing organs. So most cytokinins are synthesized in the apical meristems of roots and then transported up the shoot system through the xylem. So they have a practical use in um, botany labs, so biologists often add cytokinins to plant cells and culture to stimulate cell division to be able to study the plant cells. And in the absence of cytokinins, the cell cycle stops and cells completely stop dividing. So these are important regulators of the cell cycle. And cytokinins also work together with auxin to control cell division and differentiation. So let's take a closer look at how that works. So one of the ways in which this happens is by this apical dominance phenomenon. Apical dominance is a growth pattern restricted to main stems while the lateral buds remain dormant. This enhances the growth and height of the plant and suppresses the tendency to send out lateral branches to make the plant bushier. So if the apical bud is removed, then those lateral buds will grow, those axillary buds will start to grow. Apical dominance occurs because a continuous flow of auxin from the tips of growing shoots to the tissues below is going to actually um, suppress the lateral growth. So remember, the reason this, that this happens is that there's this trade-off between growing tall and growing bushy. So a stop in this signal, uh, a cessation of the flow of auxin means that apical growth has been interrupted in some way. So for some reason there's there's no more growth happening at that apical bud and this is a signal to the plant that the, it needs to start sending out some branches to be able to make up for the lack of growth in that apical bud. Apical dominance can be sustained by applying auxin to a shoot's cut surface. So if you cut that apical bud off and then apply auxin to the cut surface, that apical dominance will be restored as long as you keep applying the auxin. Apical dominance is going to be under the control of sugar, so the supply of sugar that is being produced in the, in the growing shoot, and also cytokinins, auxin, and another plant hormone called strigolactone. So the removal of the apical bud is going to increase the sugar availability and decrease auxin and strigolactone levels in these lower axillary buds, and that's going to initiate the growth of these axillary buds and create branching within the plant. So let's take a look at how this works. So remember that auxin is being created here in the apical bud, and it's going to be transported down through the plant. So there's going to be a concentration gradient of auxin with its greatest concentrations close to the tip and decreasing concentration as you go down through the plant. So auxin, as it moves down to these axial buds, triggers the synthesis of this other hormone, strigolactone, and it's the strigolactone that's going to be what directly inhibits the growth of these axillary buds. But we also have cytokinin being generated at the roots, and there's going to be a concentration gradient of cytokinin from the bottom of the plant going up toward the top. And so as you get farther and farther away from the tip, Auxin and strigolactone are going to have less of an influence. Cytokinin is going to have more of an influence, and there's going to be some growth of those axillary buds in response to the cytokinin. So this is in an intact plant that nobody has been cutting apical buds off of. If you do come in and cut the apical bud off, that's going to allow the growth of these axillary buds going down the shoot, but then eventually Whichever of these axillary buds grows the highest is going to take over as the new apical bud and start repressing the axillary buds below it. Now let's take a look at gibberellins. So gibberellins have a variety of effects such as stem elongation, fruit growth, and seed germination. 
Gibberellins are produced in young roots and leaves, and they're going to stimulate the growth of leaves and stems by enhancing cell elongation and cell division. In many plants, both auxin and gibberellins need to be present in order for fruits to develop. In terms of the initiation of germination of seeds, the seed is going to take in water when it's ready to grow. That could be the signal um, that it's time for that seed to start growing. So once it has imbibed some water from its environment, that's going to trigger the release of gibberellins from the embryo and that's going to be the signal for the seed to begin to germinate. So let's take a closer look at how that works. So here we have our seed with the little embryo growing on one side. Uh, endosperm is the energy-rich tissue on which the embryo is going to um, gain its energy and sugar. And then there's this layer of cells that surround the whole thing called the, the alerone. So when water enters the seed, that's going to trigger both the growing embryo and also the endosperm to release gibberellin to the cells in the alerone. The alerone then responds by producing alpha amylase, which is a digestive enzyme that's going to start to break down the starch that's stored in the endosperm and release that sugar to support the growth of the embryo. Abscisic acid is another plant hormone that is going to do the opposite. It's going to slow growth, often by antagonizing the actions of the growth hormones. So ABA has many other effects on plants, including seed dormancy and drought tolerance. Seed dormancy increases the likelihood that the seed will germinate only when conditions are optimal. So we don't want the seed starting to germinate too soon, like right in the middle of winter when it's not going to have a chance to grow. You don't want the seed to start to germinate while it's still inside the fruit. You need to make sure that the seed waits until growing conditions are optimal and then germinate. And abscisic acid is going to be critical in regulating the dormancy of the seeds so that they don't start to grow until conditions are right. So many dormant seeds germinate when abscisic acid is removed or inactivated. So you can induce the germination by shutting off abscisic acid. And precocious or early germination can be caused by inactive or low levels of ABA, either experimentally or as an adaptation, as you saw in your book with the mangrove seeds germinating early to maximize their chance for success. Gibberellins and ABA are going to interact and work together to tightly regulate the process of germination. So the ratio of abscisic acid to gibberellins often affects whether seeds will break dormancy. So many plants produce seeds that must undergo a period of drying or a period of cold, wet conditions before they're able to germinate. So in many plants, abscisic acid is the signal that inhibits seed germination, and gibberellins are the signal that triggers germination. As we mentioned before, alpha amylase is a digestive enzyme that digests starch in endosperm, releasing sugar to the embryo. So adding abscisic acid decreases alpha amylase levels adding gibberellin increases alpha amylase levels. So it's going to encourage germination by releasing those sugars. Abscisic acid, as we saw um, in an earlier unit, is going to be the primary internal signal that enables plants to withstand drought. And they're going to do this by causing stomata to close and preventing continued loss of water through the stomata. So here is a figure that we saw in an earlier chapter. We saw that the stomata are open when these cells are turgid due to a water influx and they're closed when they're flaccid and they come together and close and we saw that this is regulated by influx and efflux of potassium ions. So abscisic acid is going to cause the potassium ion channels to open, causing the potassium to flow out of the cell with water following by osmosis, causing those cells to become flaccid and the stomata to close. 
So transport of abscisic acid from water-stressed root systems to the leaves can act as an early warning system to actually close those stomata before the leaves themselves actually become water-stressed and start to conserve water. Another important plant hormone is the substance called ethylene. So ethylene is a gaseous uh, signaling molecule and plants produce ethylene in response to stresses such as drought, flooding, mechanical pressure, injury, and infection. The effects of ethylene include response to mechanical stress, senescence or the aging of the plant, leaf obsession, and fruit ripening, and we'll take a look at all of these different effects. Ethylene is produced when a seedling tip pushes against an obstacle. So if a seedling shoot is moving up through the soil or a root is moving down through the soil and it encounters a rock or another obstruction, this is going to trigger the production of ethylene within that seedling. So the production of ethylene induces what's known as a triple response. The three responses are the slowing of stem elongation and start thickening. So this is going to strengthen that stem to be able to either push that obstacle out of the way or move around it. And then the third part of the response is that the stem begins to grow horizontally to start to move around that obstacle. So growing plants are nothing if not persistent, and this is part of that persistent uh, attempt to, um, to grow up through even rocky soil, or sometimes even through um, sidewalks if they can find a little crack to grow through. This is the mechanism by which they find their way around and through these obstacles. So then once that obstruction is gone, and the ethylene wears off, vertical growth resumes, and so it can grow around an obstacle and then continue to grow upward and out through the surface of the soil. Another function of ethylene is a response to senescence, which is the regulated process of aging and death, and this is gonna be triggered by interacting hormones. So a burst of ethylene is associated with the onset of apoptosis or programmed cell death. So this is going to be um, a hormone that increases this process of senescence or aging. A change in the balance of auxin and ethylene controls leaf abscission, so the, uh, the dropping of leaves from uh, deciduous trees. We're seeing a lot of that around right now. Uh, this is the process that occurs in autumn when a leaf falls. In many cases, a burst of ethylene production in a fruit triggers the ripening process. And generally, when that ripening begins, the ripening itself is going to trigger the release of more ethylene. So this is one of the rare examples in biology of a positive feedback situation that's going to culminate in the ripening and the dropping of that fruit. Fruit producers actually exploit this uh, use of ethylene in ripening fruits. Uh, fruit producers can control ripening by picking green fruit and then controlling the ethylene level so that it can, they can ripen the fruit just before they're going to be shipped to market. So that means that they have a longer period of time before that fruit is going to go bad and not be able to be sold anymore. I'm going to quickly go through the remaining more recently discovered plant hormones. Be familiar with these in, in general terms, know generally what they do, but we're not going to go into a lot of detail on these. So brassinosteroids are chemically similar to cholesterol and the sex hormones of animals. And they are going to also be growth hormones. They're going to induce cell elongation and division in stem segments and seedlings when they're present at low concentration. They're going to slow down leaf abscission and promote xylem differentiation. Another category of recently discovered plant hormones are the jasminates, including the hormone jasminate and methyl jasminate. And these are going to play an important role in plant defense and development. So they're produced in response to wounding and are involved in controlling plant defenses response to um, damage to the plant and they're also going to regulate many other physiological processes. There's a list in your book. Don't worry too much about it. Just understand 
that these hormones are going to influence lots of different processes. And finally, strigolactones we encountered before when we were talking about apical dominance. These are going to be moving through the xylem and they're going to do a number of things, stimulate seed germination, suppress adventitious root formation, help establish mycorrhizal associations, and as we saw before, help to control apical dominance. So in this web lecture, we've reviewed the general principles of cell signaling in preparation to think about hormones as being both a response to um, a signal in the form of a stimulus, and then also being a signal in and of themselves to transmit that information throughout the, the plant to the different tissues that need to participate in the particular response. So in the next web lecture, we're going to think about the specific stimuli that the plants are responding to and how these hormones play a role in producing appropriate responses.